um, to thank Terry specifically and, and the rest of the board for mentoring me through this process. This isn't something I do very often, and Terry really made himself available, and, and I found his insight incredibly helpful. And uh, so, thank you, Terry. Well, you know, no matter what job I've ever had, um, whether it was in my design days or now in the financial world as a broker at Schwab, um, I always enjoy Monday mornings because of, of one ritual that takes place. And a lot of you understand this one question, what did you do over the weekend? And nothing's, nothing's more fun than coming in, putting your lunch in the fridge and getting that corporate coffee and sitting, <laughs> sitting down with your friends and, and, and answering that and talking about that with each other. If you spoke with me for five minutes out of this room, you know I like to talk and I like to share. So I get really excited about that. I, I, I love hearing what other people are passionate about. And if you were to ask me about a weekend, I, I might say, you know, Friday night, I had an amazing date night with my wife. We went out and we saw this, eh, it was an okay movie. I wasn't paying attention to that. I was you know, holding her hand and we went out and saw um, went to the marketplace and had a great dinner. Um, it was just fantastic. Parents babysat. <laughs> Saturday, I went out with my boys, Izzy, Darren, and Tino. We went to Buffalo Wild Wings, got a beer, got some of those raspberry chipotle wings, watched the fight. Sunday, it was a little bit more calm though. You know, I just hung out with the family. Um, I think I forgot something though. Oh yeah, church. <laughs> oh no, well, I, I went to church, but do we talk about that at work? How often when we share our stories about the weekend do we talk about church? Exactly, we don't. Not often enough. You know, I, I forget to mention that my church recently, a few weekends ago, raised about $5 million to expand two new campuses. I forgot to share with my coworkers that we just had our one year anniversary at our new Scottsdale campus. I forgot to share that we just found out we had 135 baptisms in the past year. No, why, why didn't I say that? Is it because I'm not passionate about church? You guys know me, I'm full of passion. I love church. Is it because I'm embarrassed? You know, does God only care about Sundays? Does he care about Mondays too? You know, how does God's work connect with our work when we step in the office on Mondays? If you look at Colossians 3.23, Paul says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. And when I read that, you know, I really believe Paul challenges us to think of every job as working for God, no matter how mundane, whether my wife gives me the honey-do list, um, whether it means going in Mondays and, and speaking to that angry investor that, you know, overspent their account, everything that we need to do, it's God's work. And, you know, he sees everything and he loves us. That Knowing that makes these high-pressure jobs when we walk into the office on Mondays more bearable. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor, a teacher, a realtor, a fireman, you know, we're all called to ministry. Tim Keller quotes, uh, being a Christian leads us to see our work, not merely as a way to earn money, nor as primarily a means of personal advancement, but truly a calling to serve God and love our neighbors. So why should we do this? Why should we talk about the church at work? In D.A. Carson's book, The Difficult Love of God, he asks a very contemplative question. If the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then wouldn't the greatest sin be not to love God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? This also leads to another practical question. If the second greatest commandment is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself, then wouldn't the second greatest sin be not to love your neighbor as yourself? 
I want to show you this short video. Um, some of you may know of the comedians Penn and Teller, and uh, they have a really reputable show in Vegas. They're comedians and magicians. Um, this video is about Penn, uh, the one with the long hair. He, if you don't know a little of anything about him, he's an extreme atheist. But he was touched by somebody that decided to step out, be bold, and talk to him about God. I wanted to show you this video that he records right after one of his um, comedy um, acts that he had. Got to laugh at that. 
But you also got to be embarrassed about that. We all should be, because there's a lot of circumstances where we haven't done something like that, and we know it's right there in front of our face. The good news is, is that we always have many opportunities to redeem ourselves. We're not always going to see people once. You know, why, why don't we do it? Why don't we talk about church and about God? It, you know, it's easy being a Christian. We accept Christ and we live a good life. You know, this man that spoke to him, he's a good man. A lot of times we overlook the fact that not only are we supposed to be won over to Christ, but we're supposed to be trained and sent out in the world to talk to Christ. The pastor, the realtor, the firefighter, the salesman, we all are. Evangelism is an act of obedience. Matthew 28, 18, 20, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I surely, and surely I am with you always to the very end of age. If you have a guilt that you need to be having spir spiritual conversations more often, you know, that's not good. If we're talking about God, we're talking about beauty, we're talking about hope, and we're talking about love. We're talking about everything when we're talking about God. To share something beautiful with people is totally different than wanting to just change people. If this is a beautiful thing in talking about God, it should be natural. It should be passionate. There's some of the reasons we don't share our beliefs, but one of them is we believe that evangelism is extraordinary. We suspect that it's for those who only have the gift of evangelism, for pastors or professional Christians and organizations. So we simply don't feel that we're capable of sharing. It's for the pastor. It's not for that realtor or the firefighter. The second reason is we look for immediate results. It's easy to become discouraged about our evangelism. Maybe we read a book and we're inspired or we listen to a sermon and we went out and wanted to share that and we got discouraged when nothing happened, when somebody didn't really want to hear about your, your nugget of information that you just learned. Sometimes we're not clear or confident on the message that we're, that we're giving. But we learned yesterday there's that uh, Christian jargon that we spit out. You know, it's, uh, it's been baptized by fire. You know, what does that mean? If somebody comes and says to you, what does that mean? What are you going to say? Are you prepared? Are you prepared to share the gospel? Be prepared for the tough questions. Have the tough skin. You know, when you're at work and, and you, use, you look at that example of that Monday morning story, do people know that you're a Christian? Do they expect you to talk about church? Are they kind of waiting for you to say, well, I don't want to hear about his church stuff? You know, I, I'm reminded of a time when I, a, a big turning point in my life, and I didn't know about Christians in Commerce at this time, but I can definitely see what we do here and how that impacted this time in my life. I worked, before I was in finance, I was a um, industrial designer, which is product design, and I worked and um, managed a design department at a furniture manufacturing company. We built furniture for nightclubs, bars, and gentlemen's clubs. So my role was to build portable bars, dance stages, dance poles, bottle service, anything that you can think of that relates to a nightclub and drinking. And a lot of our sales meetings started at midnight, at the club, at the casino, at the bar. I'm sure you can imagine what kind of lifestyle that is for a bunch of 25 year olds that are running this company. And, you know, we had parties, barbecues on the weekend, nothing crazy, but I remember this one weekend. And, and mind you, during this time, I'm going to church. My 
manager comes and says, hey, you know, we, we never have a barbecue on Sundays, but we're going to have one this weekend. You know, why don't you, why don't you come? I asked him what time, and he wanted to start early. I said, well, I can't. I got, I've got church. I'm going to probably be late coming from the other side of town. Church? Since when do you go to church? I didn't know that. Talk about embarrassing. Never forget it. And he doesn't even know that how much that comment impacted me. I'm a cradle Christian. I went to a Christian school K through 12. It's embarrassing. What is your brand at work when you go into the office on Monday? Some of you corporate guys might have heard of this uh, company called Gallup. What they do is that they run these very detailed evaluation programs for um, finding out your strengths. A lot of companies like my company now, Charles Schwab, we, when we're hiring new, new hires, we make them take this test because what we want to do is mentor them and, and help build and refine their strengths, find things that they're good at, work with them. And they, they have this specific test in this book that they give you when you, when you join called Strengths Finders. And there's, I want to say, like 39 different strengths. And when, at the end of this test, you are given your top five. And when they try to put you on different teams or departments, they try to diversify those teams with people of different strengths. Because when we come from different areas, we can work better together. The strengths, at, specifically at my work, are really a big component of your brand, your personal brand. Some of you marketing guys know what I'm talking about. Your logo, your, your visual logo. Um, Adele Gofo, the president of Pfizer, describes a personal brand. She says, when you live your personal brand, you're being true to yourself. And that comes through when you're interacting with others, colleagues, other leaders, and stakeholders. It contributes to authentic leadership because you're acting in a way that's consistent with your vision of who you are, what you're good at, and what matters most to you, both professionally and personally. That is a personal brand. What is your brand at work? You're probably wondering what my strengths are. Now, I've taken the test twice in the past three years, and I actually have the same top five strengths both times. Starting from number five and coming back up, number five is achiever. Number four is competition. Three is communication. Number two is called WOO, which stands for winning others over. Number one, now before I tell you what it is, it is the most rare top five strengths in the company. It's belief. I want to read to you what belief means in this Strength Finders book so that you understand. What it says here is ordinarily your belief theme causes you to be family oriented, altruistic, even spiritual, and to value responsibility and high ethics, both in yourself and others. These core values affect your behavior in many ways. They give your life meaning and satisfaction. In your view, success is more than money and prestige. They provide you with direction, guiding you through the temptations and distractions of life towards a consistent set of priorities. <laughs> Many Christians make a real effort to fit in and not make too much of the Christian faith or convictions. Taking any stand, particularly if you seem to be the only one holding an unpopular position, is really painful. It's really tough. There was a few years ago when I worked in insurance before I came to where I'm at now, I had this uh, manager, and I'll call him Dave. Um, I had met with the prospective client about insurance, and we sat down and, and chatted. And I was pretty new to the business, and um, as you know, I'm transparent. I'll tell you anything. Um, 
he wanted to sit down after the meeting and give me some just constructive criticism and feedback about how he felt that meeting went. Um, now, typically when I meet for, with the prospect, you know, for the first time, I, I let them know about my background. You build rapport. It's part of the sales pre procedure. You need them to trust you. And um, my manager made a very interesting comment at the end of our little evaluation. He said, by the way, I wouldn't necessarily start off with your meetings by pe telling people you do youth ministry. I feel it's one of those things that people are going to just take and isolate in their minds and they're going to judge you throughout the rest of your conversation and your professional relationship with them as you move forward. This being said from a man whose wife was reverent. You know, he said, if you do anything out of character, it's going to have a greater impact because of how you positioned yourself. And I remember responding, I guess that means I just have a greater conviction to do what's correct. Because I'm certainly not afraid of people knowing a Christian, and neither should you be. You know, we aren't, when it comes to a brand, we can't tell somebody that we're innovative, we're, we're honest, we're commanding, we're influential. We don't get to pick. You know, we're going to show our colleagues that we're those things. We want our colleagues to experience our brand, understand the why on what we do. We want colleagues to experience our brand. I find that walking away from a message like this and going through this little program um, creates some in neat homework opportunity for you guys as, as you go back and you know a piece of what your brand is or what you desire it to be, what you want others to see from you. Um, what kind of experience do you want to create at work as a Christian? Think about a word that can support your brand. It doesn't have to be you know, top five, just a word that want, you supports your brand that you want to be known for at work. You know, your, your faith being the foundation of your brand, it should influence the words that you create. If you can even take that word and take it a step further, support it with the Bible verse, use the foundation of what God's given us. Take that brand and, and be that when you go back. I, I did this exercise myself. I set aside the corporate identity and, and came up with mine. Now, I have to admit the irony. Be bold, be bright. I didn't know that when I did this exercise. My word is boldness. <laughs> That's what I wanted to be known for. The, the root word in boldness, it, it's parousia, which means confidence, courage, fearless public speaking, um, assurance. And to describe this, when I was doing some research on, on what does boldness really mean, I found this amazing quote by James McDonald. It says, biblical boldness for Christ is the foundation that bursts forth from a satisfied soul. Even when facing the authorities, Peter overflows with the gospel, referring to Jesus seven times in Acts 4, 10 through 12, concluding with there is no there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Boldness springs from something that is happening deep inside. If Jesus Christ changed my life, everything that I was looking for and longing for, I found in him. I have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. I have a peace that passes understanding. I have a love for people whom I should hate. I have joy and a strength I knew nothing about, so how could I not tell others that they can have it too? That is boldness. I want to go back and I want to be Brad the Bold. It's, it's, it's not Gregory the Great, but it'll do it. <laughs> Thank you.